So what I try to do now is keep my points in credit card programs like Amex membership reward points, Chase Ultimate Rewards, and then only transfer them when I find a reward ticket at a particular airline program that I like. So that giving to get that flexibility provides a lot more value to me than being locked into a single airline fly program and then trying to find all the ins and outs and all the latest developments of that program itself. And so for me, it's more of trying to save my sanity of looking at, oh, how do I use United Mileage Program the best, right? Oh, I have Qatar Miles. How do I get that, that Q seats in there? Now I just look into these websites where, for example, pointsme.com or there's many other ones, right? Where you plug in your destination and origination when you want to fly and it tells you based on your itinerary, here are all the options that you can redeem those flights on. And so I would just use whatever Amex or Chase points I have, redeem it to the program that gives me the most value and go from there. And that saves me a little bit more time that I can focus more on my business and focus on my family and friends. Hey there, points people. You just heard a clip from John Pham from Azuric 81. John is the founder of The Money Ninja, a personal finance brand that teaches people how to make more money and save it better. He is an avid points geek and traveler, collecting his first mile in 2001 and making his first international trip at the age of six. Since then, John has become a huge success in many of the areas that we get questions about all the time. Points and miles, e-commerce, and turning your content creation into a full-time business. In this episode, John and I discuss topics around personal finance, e-commerce, and travel rewards. John also shares how he achieved financial independence, allowing him to leave his corporate job. If you are looking to turn your points and miles passion into a business, a business credit card such as the Chase Inc. Business Preferred card may be right for you, especially since business credit cards can really supercharge how fast you can earn more points. Remember, if you decide to apply for the Chase Inc. Business Preferred credit card or any other card, never apply directly through Google. Always use a friend or creator's referral link. And if you're interested in supporting this show when you apply for your next card, check out geobreezetravel.com slash cards. And if you're not sure what card is right for you, I offer free credit card consultations at geobreezetravel.com slash consultations. And we have the links to the Chase Inc. Business Preferred Credit Card and the free consultation form for you in the show notes as well. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina-American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. Quick, what is the best deal to fly from Chicago to Europe in June on a business class flight? If you plug that search into PointMe's new Explore page, you'd see that you could fly from Chicago to Belgrade for about 25,000 points or to Zurich for about 25,000 points. Yes, that was a mixed business class via Air Canada where it's about 82% in business class. The Point Me Explore feature is a great tool to use when you just want to find the best deal possible. But maybe you want to put in a few parameters like the month you want to travel or the continent that you want to travel to. Try it out yourself and let me know what deals you find. Check out Point Me by going to geobreezetravel.com slash pointme and get your first three searches free. Again, that's geobreezetravel.com slash pointme, P-O-I-N-T-M-E. Hey, John, welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, Julia, thanks for having me over here. Of course, I'm so excited to have you here today and to talk about your journey and how you earn a ton of different points and miles with your different ventures. But before we get into all of that, Tell us a little bit about you and how you got started with the game of points and miles. Great to talk to everyone here. So I got into the mileage game or whatever you want to call it, right? During my sophomore year of college, this is 2022. So I'm aging myself a little bit here, but back then we didn't have social media and many of the travel nerds like myself were on message forums like Fly Talk and Batwall just to learn the ins and outs of the points redemption system, right? Because we didn't have a lot of resources as we do now to understand how to best redeem them, what points are worth more than others. And at around that time frame, I had launched an e-commerce business called Zurich and racked up a lot of American Express membership reward points by buying business inventory, right? I was, I was basically buying things from Asia, reselling them here on platforms like eBay, Craigslist. 
And that eventually led to invitation to the American Express Black Card, the supporting card. And since it gave me automatic elite status for a bunch of airlines and, and hotel programs, it made me agnostic to what airline hotel status to chase, right? Because I had pretty much all of them. So what I did back then was convert all those points to Southwest for free flights, where I would resell those free flights and receive automatic companion pass when I actually do fly with Southwest. And so that's what really started everything. And then the mileage game got really addicting, where in 2000, this is 2003 onwards, I did virtually everything that was possible at the time to earn more miles, right? So I bought a bunch of pudding. Every time you unwrap the pudding thing, the wrappers on the top, it gave you 500 American airline miles. And I think a lot of folks in frequent flyer talk figured out that the cost of buying the pudding was going to be a lot cheaper than the miles itself. So we were like spending all days buying pallets of pudding and unwrapping them all the time. We did that. We bought coins on the U.S. Mint when they were selling dollar coins with no credit card fees. United, just to keep the status of 1K back then, I was flying from Boston where I'm based out of to Frankfurt. And in the bad economy in 2008, 2009, they were offered double elite miles for that, right? So you would fly round trip. And back then, the miles you earned was based on the miles you flew. So 7,000 miles round trip times two for the elite status, or 14,000 miles for what you could have got back at the time, $150 flight, $200 flight. So you do it a few times, which I did, right? I skipped Thanksgiving weekend one time to fly back and forth twice. And I got my mom and dad really upset at the time. But when I redeemed those flights to Vietnam, they were pretty happy afterwards. Here's where we are today where I can't do those things anymore just because how life has gotten so busy. But now with a personal finance brand, digital content brand, I'm able to use the, my primary focus on the business. But because of all the spend on my business, I'm able to earn more miles and points than I had back then chasing all these deals just as a secondary benefit of being a business owner. Wow. You dove deep real quick when you were just starting out with this. You got access to the black card when you were still in college? Yeah, so uh, there was an article on the New Hampshire about this. I think I was 21 or 22. And at that time, the black card, the touring card, charged about $1,000 per year. And then it was raised to 2,500. But people who had the black card at the time were grandfathered at that rate. I know now it's like something ridiculous, right? It's like a $5,000 initiation fee, $10,000 annual fee. I don't have the card now. I think I probably would have kept the card, but being such a young person and not traveling so much at the time, it was not worth the annual fee. And so I canceled it, right? And now that I'm flying all the time for business, all the time for personal reasons, I wish I had kept it. I think earning so many miles and points on credit cards has offset the loss of all the perks and benefits that Amex Black Card gave me. But yeah, I was young. The Black Card just became mainstream back then. And I was asking ridiculous things, right? I think when I was in college, I was a junior in college and my friends were asking, oh, John, can you open up that Walmart to buy M&Ms and get blue M&Ms in the jar? America's Best is renowned on the concierge service to do things as much as they can. And I'm not sure they had that flexibility now, but they were able to contact the Walmart store manager to open up the store temporarily to get an Amex rep to buy the M&Ms and deliver it to our dorm room. So we had a jar full of blue M&Ms that they hand-picked out or whatever they did. But it's one of those crazy requests that we did back as a young 22, 23-year-old. Wait, you were requesting this of the Amex concierge? Yeah, so the Amex Black Card, typically people ask, like, help me with the travel or get me these hard to find tickets. But they really market back then is if you need something, we'll get it for you. And so it was around 10, 10 30. The local Walmart, I think it was Walmart, the local Walmart was closed. I called the American Express Black Concierge line to ask. We really want blue MMs in one jar. We're doing something on our college campus. And it didn't, it took a little bit longer than we thought, like, I think three or three and a half hours, but they delivered in like a weird hour on a weekend night where it was super busy and crazy, but it was probably the only time I requested something that was not of value, just to request to see, is it even possible? And I know that they probably restricted some of these crazy requests since then, but it was a really great card, right? They only earned one point per dollar. I think the perks and benefits of elite status and having the concierge who would help you with certain things, right? Buying my college sweetheart at the time, Valentine's flowers and the card because I forgot or help them book travel because I was not able to look at that when I was attending classes. It was a really crazy service at the time where it was relatively new and people were trying to prod and print and pull to see how much they could actually get the value out of that before Amex said, this has to stop. We're going to do serious requests and not blue M&Ms at, at two in the morning. That is a crazy request. Okay. I wanted to ask about something else you mentioned. You were booking Southwest flights and then reselling them to other people. They were just transferable back then and they're not now. 
Yeah, so I don't know what the system is now. I haven't, I haven't booked Southwest in a long time, but if I can recall 20 years ago, what happened was the points were able to convert to Southwest and it was on a different type of credit back then. I think it was 1,250 Southwest credits equals a free one-way flight in Southwest, or whatever it was, right? And so the more points you transfer from Amex to Southwest, you had to buy enough credits to earn a free one-way trip. And those tickets were electronic at the time. And I'm not sure, obviously that I was young, I'm not sure what the stipulation of the rule was. I probably get banned if I would try to do it today. But back then it was super easy to put someone's name on an electronic ticket and book a flight for them, free cancellations. And because I earn elite stats, like I said, right, across all these programs, I had no desire to earn uh, the companion pass for Southwest. And being a college student, I didn't buy so much outside of spring break. And so short in cash, and flush with miles and points, I basically converted those to Southwest electronic tickets with a one-year validity date. I think I sold on eBay. I basically posted on eBay saying, here's a flight. I resold it for $250 to $300 per ticket. And they would just give me the name, the destination. And it was really super easy to book. Right now, given it's been 20 years ago, I do know, and not with a specific degree of detail, that it has changed. And obviously, we know in the mileage game that they frown upon reselling the miles. In fact, it's against the terms and service of most airline program, so you can get banned from it. But this is, again, young and dumb, John, naive, and just trying to make an extra buck for all these millions of points that I didn't have a use for at the time. How much volume were you doing in e to get the black card and to be able to run all of these different side things? Was it just that every point went so much further 20 years ago, or were you doing like a lot of e-commerce out of your well, dorm room? It was full. I think back then, if you think about it, now we have crazy sign-up bonuses, right? You open up an American Express Platinum card, get 150,000 points. That's a crazy amount. In 2002, 2003, 2004, you're looking at 25,000 points at the max with average offers of 15,000 or 20,000 to spend as a sign-up bonus. So really what it was, was buying about 100, $150,000 worth of inventory per month, sometimes even more than that. We sell those inventory, right? But then you're earning 150,000 points. And these things would just collect cumulatively where I had so many points as a college student with nowhere to burn, really. And one of the avenues was to resell it. And it's crazy because all that inventory went to, my dad had a business. He had an engineering company in Sam, New Hampshire. So in the weekends during college, I would drive back home, pick up all these inventory. There were LCD monitors, computer systems, IT software. And LCDs were premium back then, right? They're not a commodity like they were now selling for $100, $200. They were going for thousands of dollars. And so I would bring them to my dad's warehouse. He would let me store it in the back of his warehouse for free. And then every time someone bought it off and us on eBay, I would send him all the customer's addresses. He would ship them off. He would print those UPS things on a printer. I didn't pay him at all. I should have. I feel bad. It was basically free labor from him. He would slap them onto the, the Dell box or whatever we bought. And that's how we make the money, right? So the profit margins weren't great. It's probably a lot thinner now trying to resell things on Amazon, on eBay. But back then it was still about a 5.5% profit margin. Every thousand dollars we buy, you make a hundred dollars in profit, right? But we were churning six figures of inventory. And then plus with the points that you earn, back then I don't think we people thought about category bonuses or there weren't a lot of cards with category bonuses at the time. So I used the black card for pretty much all my purchases and earn a one for one dollar to to point conversion and then use those points just convert uh, over and over southwest and actually i i don't know why i'm like i'm a i keep things nostalgically so i have screenshots of the amex website back then how it looked and me convert all those points to southwest and how my balance were up like a few hundred thousand few million i would burn them all and then receive cash as it's on the southwest on ebay and then keeping that as an additional revenue stream for the business or for myself you said six figures. Was that annually or per month? No, that was per month. It was per month. Yeah. I think the scale of it was 2003, 2004. We were probably buying about 150 up to 200,000 at, at the top with an average of about 150K. So we're talking about a million something in points per year just for inventory, right? And that's just not the shipping that we paid UPS to ship all the boxes. It wasn't buying all the supplies, like the shipping labels, the tell you. And, and as a business to call student, I was able to deduct a proportion of my cell phone bill and other items because we had a business use for it, right? So it was a double whammy at the time where I was going through business college and I was actually using real world business experience to understand 
how do I maximize my mileage gain at the same time, reduce my tax liability as a business owner? If you were 20 years younger and doing all of this again today, how would you recommend somebody get started with e-commerce? Because the game has changed so much. People are like listening to this thinking, Amex doesn't transfer to Southwest. And like, I don't know if I could run 100,000 out of my dorm room. How would you recommend somebody get started today out of doing e-commerce and doing any of this? Because e-com is one of, I think, most effective ways to get a lot of points and miles out of that yeah, like yeah. inventory. I think that you have to start small, right? I think that a lot of people who look at YouTube videos or other Instagram influencers with people with six-figure Amazon, eBay businesses, they get into their head that, oh, let me start a business and I'll immediately be successful. And really the truth of this is, right, without buying any books or classes, is that a lot of people who are successful in this just basically did like a test and learn trial, right? They dip their toes in the water. They didn't understand the whole ecosystem of what it takes to buy and resell, right? They don't consider the cost of shipping something out or the logistics of buying something. How do people pay you? What are the credit card fees for that or PayPal fees for that? So there's a lot of expenses to consider along with the inventory. Right? How much inventory is enough before you're at risk of not selling this and now it's going to sit in your warehouse, your home or garage or whatever, be worthless. So I think that if you're really interested in these things, I think it's best to dip your toes in the water, try out a few products and see, one, how does it really work from A to Z, right? To, to manage a, a listing, to sell at one time, receive a payment, what are the intricacies of it? What are the issues you can, you're gonna, you won't necessarily forecast thinking going to this business. And as you find something that actually works or something that's more the profit margins, is something that's doable, then you start to scale up saying, oh, I tried all these 10 products or whatever it may be. Here's two that had the pretty good high profit margins in demand. Let me scale up and buy a few more items and see where I go with this, right? And I think that's a lot of people, how it worked. It, no one's getting this game and saying, I'm going to buy a million dollars worth of inventory and sell the first day, right? I think to that, there are a lot of videos that will can be helpful. But what it turns out to is, for example, I have a friend of mine, he's based out of Maine. He got started buying things on AliExpress. I think it was cell phone cases for 40 cents per case, right? Started selling these on Amazon. This is back 10 years ago. Started finding success out of that. And then one of the things he, he thought about himself as well, AliExpress and Alibaba is a lot cheaper than what I can buy things at TJ Maxx at a discount. But then what's the next step, right? I'm getting these things at volume at a discount, but are there things beyond AliExpress, Alibaba that can scale? Because, right? Because one thing you can grow your business is not only selling more, but it's how to reduce your fixed costs, your inventory costs. And so what he did was he actually flew to China and met all these heads of these factories and asked them if a new phone was coming out, can we mold a specific piece of a cell phone case and kind of brand it ourselves and then resell it? One, reducing the cost per piece, right? And then him giving himself a brand name that people would recognize in the future. And so there's many ways to different levers to pull in order to either reduce your expenses or increase revenue, but it's really just like a corporate job. It's a test and learn. You find out what works and you scale that up rather than trying to go for the grand slam home run and losing your all your marbles just in case it doesn't work out. For sure. I heard that recommendation a lot where in your first probably year of Amazon or e-com or something, you're not going to hit that grand slam right away. A lot of it is just learning the mechanics. It's listing stuff you already have sitting around your house on Poshmark or eBay or something and just yeah. learning the mechanics of clicking through these different sites. And then maybe step number two is download the Amazon app that lets you scan different barcodes for things. And then you can go through Office Depot or something in the clearance section. And then, oh, these staplers are on sale. Maybe I can buy them for $6 at Office Depot on sale and then resell them for $15 or something on Amazon. That might be step two. And in all of that time and work, You've probably made two dollars in yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you've learned the skill of how to navigate these things. So I think that's a good way to start is just test and learn, like you said. And then once you find something that hits, you can scale up from there. You can build your own brand with that example of the cell phone cases. So yeah, that's what I did, right? It was I was working at a grocery store in high school, making I think back at the time five dollars and fifty cents an hour. And I think my first foray into eBay, I think Amazon wasn't really that popular at that time, right? Was I went to Walmart, found a bunch of these, I don't know what they called. My bed sheets were, my mom bought me these bed sheets that was like a sun and moon pattern or whatever. I thought it was really cool. Went to Walmart, found them for $30, $35, and we sold it online on eBay for 50, right? But after all the shipping fees and the eBay commission, it wasn't that much, but it gave me that 
little inception idea to like, this could actually work if I found something that was a bit more profitable, the margins were there and just scale it up, right? And, and now obviously being a little bit older and, and hopefully wiser in some aspects, I realized that a lot of people may get into business and immediately think about how do I maximize the point miles game as a business owner? And I think it's actually opposite. Once you've mastered your business and optimize all the operational opportunities you can, the mile came is really secondary, but it's at the point where you're spending so much money on certain things that you can start to think about, okay, now that my business is actually growing and growing fast, you're not really dependent on the miles so much anymore, but it comes almost second nature. How do you maximize that? Right? So case in point now with my personal finance brand, I buy a lot of advertising on Facebook, right? And so back then, maybe 22 year old John, we put down my black card or one point per mile, a one point, point per dollar spent. Now with a card, let's say the American Express Gold business card, right? It gives you four times points for advertising purchases, which Facebook ads are considered that, up to $150,000 to spend per year. So I spend more than that, but let's just say I put $150,000 on my Amex Gold card at four points per dollar. That gives me 600000 Amex points automatically on the, just that portion of the advertising alone, right? And that's much more than I got from buying dollar coins per month and then going to the bank and depositing those coins for miles and then paying my credit card balance with my bank account, right? That's a lot of gas, a lot of time invested and a lot of different steps you have to take. And here, because I've actually scaled my business enough to actually spend six figures of advertising, that those points just become second nature. How do you maximize that spend? Yeah, I'm the same way where we advertise on Facebook and Instagram as well. And that brings in quite a few clients for our consulting arm of how to use points and miles and maximize strategies and things like that. And then the revenue from those clients will pay for the ads and it just scales up like a normal business. And it does just involve applying a lot of those first business principles instead of like, okay, I'm going to go drive to Staples, then I'm going to go drive to Walmart, then I'm going to try to stuff a money order back into my bank account because those things were (laughs) stressful and fleeting. And you never know when you're going to get shut down for that. Whereas if it is legitimate business processes, they scale a lot better. And then the points are just gravy from there. I don't want to say that I've gotten out of the game completely, right? When I do have free time and my wife will probably kill me in this too, is I try to find opportunities where the time investment is less So for instance, when COVID, the pandemic happened, I think in May, 2020, Marriott was fearing how they're going to make the revenue with everyone not booking hotels. And they offered, I think 20% off their gift cards, right? And fear of, well, we need some revenue. And I jumped on that deal with multiple credit cards just to buy it. And two years later, when the world started opening up a lot more, I'm getting to these Marriott hotels at a huge discount where I start earning like the elite nights credits and also the elite spend on like the remaining balance, right? And so... I still do the deal. It's probably not at the, I probably try to chase like the bigger ones and and the ones that take less time commitment versus what I did before 15, 20 years ago. That's a good segue. So since you focus most of your time and energy now on your businesses, your personal finance brand, how do you source what's the most effective use of time to still enjoy the points and miles game because it's still a fun hobby for you, but without having to drive to multiple locations to pick up some gift cards or something. How do you balance all of that? When I do get free time, so for example, right, if I'm flying internationally and I'm sitting in business class laying down, my wife's asleep, I'm bored. So I'll look at through my phone, it's connected to Wi-Fi and I still check out blogs, right? Not just the points guy, but one mile at a time, upgrade points. There's a lot of blogs and influence out there that will give you an overview of like what's the landscape is changing, right? I just read a five minute blurb on what has changed with Alaskan Airlines. But one of the things I like to do besides reading a lot of these blogs where they can give you an overview within four or five minutes is to change the, my attitude, my behavior on these things. Where back then, if I had a lot of time and commitment, I would try to squeeze every single value by, oh, what credit card should I spend for this category? And I would have a bunch of points in United a bunch of points on American Airlines. So what I try to do now is keep my points in credit card programs like Amex membership reward points, Chase Ultimate Rewards, and then only transfer them when I find a reward ticket at a particular airline program that I like. So that give, give that flexibility provides a lot more value to me than being locked into a single airline fly program and then trying to find all the ins and outs and all the latest developments of that program itself. And so for me, it's more of trying to save my sanity of looking at, oh, how do I use United mileage program, the best, right? Oh, I have guitar miles. How do I get that, that Q seats in there? Now I just look into 
these websites where, for example, pointsme.com or there's many other ones, right? Where you plug in your destination and origination when you want to fly and it tells you based on your itinerary, here are all the options that you can redeem those flights on. And so I would just use whatever Amex or Chase points I have, redeem it to the program that gives me the most value and go from there. And that saves me a little bit more time that I can focus more on my business and focus on my family and friends. For sure. And I think a lot of people, when they first start out, especially these days, they're going to get most of their points from sign-up bonuses. And mm -hmm. they think, okay, if I'm spending $100,000 a year, maybe I open like five cards to get a whole bunch of sign-up bonuses. If I'm spending a million dollars a year, I would just open like a new credit card every other week and then just get sign-up bonuses all over the place, earn millions of miles. You and I both know that's not how the game is actually played once you are spending a lot of money and turning a lot of cash flow through cards. How do you actually think about getting new cards and the strategy of how many cards to hold and when to go for sign-up bonuses versus when to just use category bonuses like the yeah. Amex Business Gold 4X? That's a great question, Julia. I think that the credit card program game has changed a lot, right? Back then, you could have churned multiple credit cards many times over in a given year and get the same sign-up bonus over and over. So people were racking millions, hundreds of thousands of, of, of miles across all these programs. Now, as you see, like, uh, for example, Chase has a 524 rule, right? Where you can't have more than five credit cards open within a 24-month period. And so a lot of these credit card issuers aren't stupid, right? They're trying to minimize what I call the gamification of miles, what people try to do. So now we know that trying to do this long-term, you're potentially going to get your miles being forfeit you're probably not going to get approved for these cards anymore. So what I try to do is not go crazy with the sign-up bonuses, but sign up for a bonus. One, look for a credit card that provides the best value for what category you do intend to spend, right? So for me, example, the one where I talk about Facebook advertising, I know that I should probably get a card that gives me a lot of points or a lot of outsized value for spending on ads, right? So one example, that's the Amex Gold Business Card. One of the Chase Inc. cards also provides, I think, three times ad spend. And so you try to look for what card programs out there gives you the best value for what you're trying to spend, given the category you're going to spend in, versus, oh, well, here's a British Airways card that's going to give me X amount of points. Here's a Barclays card that's going to give me X amount of American airline points. But then you're going to have points and miles spread between all these different credit card and hotel programs. And with all the expiration dates and all the expiration policies each of these programs have, you're going to go crazy trying to find out, oh, what program is going to expire next month? How am I going to generate activity to keep those miles from expiring? So I think that as a business owner, you need to focus on your number one bread and butter, right? It's like making your business successful and de dedicating a lot of time to it. And I think earning points should be something that you think about from like a high bird's eye view, meaning what do I spend in, in a given year and how do I maximize that without going crazy, sign up for 10, 15 cars and one, running the risk of not getting approved for it. And then two, maybe getting banned from it for the game in the credit card system. And three, you can track up all the data when they expire and everything. So for me, it's really, I try to sign up for maybe three or four credit cards per year. And I tend to wait for really good and juicy sign up bonuses to get. And that's how I approach sign-up bonuses now versus what I did when I was a little bit younger. What are some of the cards that you've opened recently where you're like, this was worth opening a new credit card slot and just reconfiguring a lot of your banking and a lot of your cash flows? Because that can be actually pretty disruptive to business owners if they're like, I have to move all of my accounts over to this new card. What are some of the cards where you found it's been worth it to do that? recently. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just looking through, I have a lot of active credit cards, but so one, one I just opened, I had an Amex business card for another company of mine. I just opened one up about a year ago. I think it offered 150,000 Amex points after you spend $15,000 or $20,000, something like that. That was something I got into mainly for the sign-up bonuses. A lot of people use the Amex business more for the sign-up bonus because most of the purchases that earn a dollar per, per dollar spent. But I think there are some things you can use. Like, for instance, if you have big ticket items, if you spend over 5,000 points on a single purchase, those are now worth 1.5 MR points per dollar spent, right? And so I look for things where at that time I had all these other cards that would give me category spending bonuses. But I thought to myself, well, what card should I use for day to day purchases that don't really have a category spending bonus? And I looked into Amex with that 1.5 rate, and that was no-brainer for me. Another one was the Chase Unlimited Ink Card. It gives you 1.5 UR points all the way across any type of spend. 
So that was another card where if I, I wasn't spending on a category bonus, I would also defer to the Chase Inc. Limited card in order to get that 1.5 times spend bonus too. Those were like my baseline cards where those are for general category spending. And then I'm still a sucker for good sign-up bonuses. So if like one card I just opened up was a city business card. I think it gave like a higher than usual sign-up bonus of 70,000 or 75,000 American airline miles for after you pass the spending requirement. So something I open up, but I fly American Airlines a lot. And so I do appreciate the two times American Airlines miles I earned by buying American AA flights, right? And so that's something I use for that. But every card I sign up for has a, a purpose and intent for that. And I'm not signing a card just solely for the sign-up bonus. It's more of, okay, that's a pretty good bonus. What else does the card offer that I can use beyond the original sign-up bonus, right? Because the, the one thing I don't want to do is get a sign-up bonus, put it in the closet or a sock drawer, not use it again. Just because of the nature of my business and how busy I get, I want to use cards that I want to sign up for cards that I would actually use beyond just the first like two, three months to get that sub. Do you use a lot of cards that just earn you status by putting spend on it as well? Are you into Hyatt or American Airlines or Delta or any of those? Yeah, so I'm a Hyatt globalist and I'm a Marriott Platinum. I think people, it depends on where you live, what region or country you travel to. But as a globalist, I find that it gives you the best value out of all hotel loyalty programs out there. And as a globalist, you need 60 nights per year. I probably spend about 50 nights organically at hotels, but I'm missing 10 nights, right? And so I have a high personal card and I put some spend on that because one of the perks of this card is every $5,000 you spend, you get two elite night credits for that year. So I'm at 50 nights organically. I need 10 nights left over. So I usually spend a lot in my Hyatt card to get over that maximum. If I travel somewhere for business or personal that doesn't have a Hyatt property or one that's not really convenient, my fallback is Marriott. I fell in love during the Starwood properties. SPG got rolled into Marriott. That's how I became a member of, of Marriott itself. But I have both the Marriott American Express card and the Chase Marriott card. So what's cool about that is every single year, I get 15 elite nights awarded to me by being a MX card member for the Marriott card. And then for the Chase version, I get another 15 nights. So to start with that in January, I'm already getting 30 nights total. And I can easily spend another 20 nights organically, giving me 50 nights for that platinum status. So now I know that whenever I travel, I'm going to get free breakfast through Hyatt or Marriott. I'm going to get the elite spending bonuses. And I'm going to get the perks and upgrades that come with being elite status for those programs, right? And so those are my kind of go-to. And the only thing, I, the Hyatt's by far my most favorite program. It's just unfortunate that the global footprint is a lot smaller than the Marriott itself. And so I think it's good for anyone when they're thinking about airlines or hotels to look for, depending on where you're located and where you're traveling to, find your primary airline hotel that you want to be loyal to, but always have a plan B, a backup hotel and airline, just in case that that airline is not available or that hotel's not, that brand's not available at the location you're traveling to. Yeah, I'm the same way where Hyatt's my primary and Marriott's my secondary. And I really like the programs like Hyatt and American Airlines where if you do have a lot of expenses, you can put, I think it's $120,000 at worst in a year on the Hyatt business credit card, get top tier global status, even right, if you've yeah. never stayed at a Hyatt before with American Airlines. I think it's $200,000 at worst, but most people spend way less than that because there are so many different promos. But worst case, $200,000 on an American Airlines credit card will get you executive platinum. As aspiring business owners or people who have their own businesses, one of the, I think the key important thing is just remember that the miles and points is a extra perk for running a business, right? If you're running a successful business and you're making money and you can support your livelihood instead of working somewhere else, that's really one, I think one of the biggest perks in the world, right? And I won't speak for everyone else, but as a location agnostic person, I'm in Boston like I am now, but I'm always on the road. I'm always going with my wife to some travel place. Like for instance, Last year, we did three different trips to Maldives. We stayed between 10, 15 nights each. And I love it because she loves the tropical place, warm water, but I can be at the pool or sitting on, the, on a lounge chair, logging away and earning miles and points, right? Writing about things I love. So I think that one of the things that people really want to focus on, if you own a business, of course, like you can't depend on anyone else to give you that steady paycheck and you have to take care of your health care, your dental, right? Your retirement. So I think that it's paramount that your business is like 99% of your focus, but as it scales up, you become more profitable, you hire more employees, or 
let's just say that you plateau, but you optimize all the operational qualities that you need to be successful and you have a little bit more free time, then you pull back a little bit and find out, well, if I'm spending X amount of dollars per year, then what car should I use to give me more miles and points without spending too much time on that, right? Versus the opposite where I see a lot of people see like these exotic traveling business class or traveling for business and they just get sucked into that lifestyle. And the first thing they think is they're, they're basically doing 50-50, right? They're putting 50% of their focus on the business and 50% on what credit card to spend on, what points to earn. And I think that that gives you a lot less chance to succeed in what you should be doing versus what's really best for you. I love that advice. If you can just go all in with a business first, the lifestyle will take care of itself. And I think a lot of people forget in the age of social media, a lot of people who are really good at points and miles, we weren't born that way. We spent many years getting our knowledge, possibly before we ever made a single Instagram post or blog post or YouTube video. And some people just want to just dive in and be like, in one year, I want to quit my job and like, be jet setting all over the world in key yeah. suites. And if you can be hyper focused for like a year where you're putting in 20 hours a week or 40 hours a week religiously into your craft and just honing your craft, the points just come like yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, the biggest key there, right? I think that I was working a corporate job for 20 years in my life right after college, right? And these were really, they're great. I don't want to say anything bad about it because they were great corporate careers, right? I was making really good money. And I think that what people have to focus on is don't look to change a job because you want a certain lifestyle. It's more of do something you're really passionate about. Do something. I don't want to say it's, it's so cliche, but if it was, if you got paid less to do it, or it was almost free, but you didn't care about the financial aspect, would you still be passionate about it? And when you can definitely see when people talk about miles and points, they're really into it or personal finance, you can just see through their aura and their energy that they love what they're doing. And I think that's the same thing for me, right? I did this, I was working a nine to five, nine to six corporate career, right? And I started, so side note here, right, Julia, and I think that people will enjoy this is when the points guy first got started, this is like 2010, 2011, social media was non-existent. And he was just a regular member on Flyer Talk, the message board that we're all part of. And I helped him out on one of his posts, right? It, it turned out to be one of his biggest posts at the time. It was how do you get sign up for the British Airways credit card for 100,000 miles? And at that time, where other cards were given 25 miles, 25,000 miles, it was a huge bonus increase. So he wrote about that. And I remember he reached out and said, Hey, do you want to work for this blog? I'm like, What does it make? Like, how are you making money of these things? Right? What's credit card affiliates? Like, there's no way I'm going to give up my corporate career to work on some like website. And obviously, now we know that TPG is a multi million dollar business and it got bought out by bank rate who bought out with by Red Venture. So super successful, right? But the whole point is he didn't do this to think about the money aspect. What he told me was he just blogged about this. And then a Rakuten representative in New York who knew him pulled him aside for a meeting and said, hey, you're advertising all these credit cards. Why don't you use an affiliate link to earn money from that? And that's how it got started. And for me, I wrote about how to make more money, how to save it better by showing people, look at all these bank bonuses, right? Don't sign up for a bank account for free or, or on Google. If you use someone's affiliate link or use someone's referral, you can basically get $300, $500, $1,000 to open a business bank account or a personal bank account and it's free money. And I think that grew because I organically shared with my readers on how to make more money in their personal life. And I remember showing my wife about three years ago, I made my first like one or two cents on Google ads. And I showed her that screenshot on my phone. I was like, yeah, look at this. It was when we were going to bed. And she's like, oh my God, that's a great. But it's, it took three months working 60 hours per week to get the first penny. And I think a lot of people don't realize that because they, they look at people now, right? I know that I've been very fortunate. I'm an outlier too, because the business is growing fast, but I think people have to understand that every one of us started somewhere and it was a lot more humbling experience than what people think, right? Because what people see now, is really just the tip of the iceberg, but underneath that water is so much work and dedication. And, and if you divided how much hours they spent to make that one penny, I probably earned 0. 0.00001 cent per hour, right? It was something ridiculous. So I think that don't chase the money initially, find something that you're really great about and really passionate about it and find a way to monetize the business. And in this age where you can reach your readers and other enthusiasts through many different social media channels and online avenues and ads or whatever, the opportunities now has never been greater versus what it was 20, 30 years ago. What do people watch? They watch TV ads. And that was really their avenue of learning about things, right? TV programs. And now we have blogs, we have blogs, we have Instagram videos. I see your videos all the time in IG and I, I watch them all, right? And I think that even someone who has known a lot about 55 miles, 
when I see your videos pop in my newsfeed, I still learn a little bit like, oh, I know this promotion existed last week. Let me look at it, right? And so it's one of those things that no matter how much of an expert or a subject matter expert you are, it's almost hard to be caught up with everything that's been happening, especially these limited time promotions. So it helps to follow people in your kind of like passion social circle and find out things that would probably take you hours to learn. And this is like these quick tips that you've learned through. You're in the train this morning to go to work. You're in an airplane flying somewhere. Let me read about what Julie has to say about her Instagram. Let me read about one mile at a time, what's new, and then take advantage of that based on your new knowledge. Yeah, I really like that advice of see if it's something that you can do for a while as well. Do something that you're passionate about. Because if you're like, I hate doing this for free for 20 hours, you're going to hate it more when somebody is paying you to do it and being like, oh, we need you to redo that video. Or if like somebody on the internet is just being annoying and you're like, I'm doing this for free. So if you don't enjoy doing it when it's just a hobby and you have 200 people following you, I promise it's not going to be more fun when you have 200,000 people following you. And some of those people are legitimately crazy. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The way I think about it is Marina, right? My wife, she had asked me early on this journey, basically just saying, asking me this question where if you were making one fourth of what you're making in your corporate career, if it was sustainable, would you still do it? And without even thinking for one or two seconds, I said, yes. Right. And so that's when I knew that a dollar earned doing my own thing was worth more than $4 working for someone else. Right. And not to say that's a bad thing. I thoroughly enjoyed my corporate career. I did corporate strategy and finance, but what I learned was that I'm much more passionate about personal finance and helping others and sharing all these ways to make and save money. Then it was to like cross some T's and dot some I's at some corporate. Obviously, we're all trying to make money, but when you're investing yourself, you have so much more skin in the game and so much more passion in the game that you're working extra hours when you don't realize it. And it's not because you want to overwork yourself. It just feels fun to you, right? If I'm working two hours overtime in my corporate career, I'm like, oh, when can I get home? I got to finish this up, but then I'm exhausted. If I spend two extra hours writing about this content I'm really excited about, I realized it took longer and maybe I wanted to spend a little less time on it, but I don't end the day exhausted. Like I'm upstairs talking to my wife, like I just finished this post. I want to see the, the reader comments on that. People are emailing me asking these questions and I feel more alive in that, right? But there is a balance between don't overwork yourself but at the same time. If you're working a lot of hours, you don't feel tired. That's one of the clearest signals that what you're doing is something you love and not something that you're actually waking up and dreading to do. And that's exactly what you're saying, right? Do something you love and find a way to monetize it because it's one thing to say, do something you love and you're making zero dollars of it. It's not sustainable. And you have to juggle multiple jobs with this, but it's one thing, any job you have, I don't want to say virtually every single thing that someone loves to do, there's always, always a way to monetize things, right? And when I look at TikTok videos and YouTube videos of people making a lot of money doing things that I would never imagine you can make money of, that kind of told me that you can do anything as long as you love what you're doing and you can share that across different channels and mediums that you're going to kill it eventually, right? And it may not be the first month, three months, six months, a year. It may take some time depending on like where you are. But I think that once you put that energy into the game, your probability of success is just exponential. What are some of your favorite like 80-20 rules for if someone's like, I love talking about Moines and Miles, I love talking about travel, I love producing content for now, but... I got to pay rent and I got to put food on the table and all of that. And I can't just have it be a labor of love forever. What's your 80, 20 for somebody who's like, I think I could do this, but like, I got to get a paycheck. Yeah. So I think before you even get to that question, I think that if you want to do something right, and obviously everyone's personal finance situation is different. I don't want people to be like, okay, I'm really passionate about points and miles. I want to blog about it. So let me quit my job tomorrow and then stop blogging. Right. Because one, you're not going to make money for quite a long time. And two, you just left the only guaranteed income that will sustain your mortgage, your rent, or whatever it may be. So I think that if you're really interested in pursuing something, and you don't have to have a cookie cutter strategy like, like a path like I did, but you need to be able to balance both, right? Continue working in your current role, your current job, because that's bringing stability to your life, which removing that stress of where money's coming from is a huge thing for people psychologically. So if you're doing something, do it on the weekends. Do it at nighttime, do it during the hours when you have a little bit of free time. And that will give you like that kind of, like what I said before, right? Put one foot over the line and seeing how does it work operationally. And another thing is too, is something you think you love, you might hate, right? You might start doing this and be like, oh, I don't actually like writing about this all day long. So I'm going to cancel that. So before you quit your job, it's like, I'm going to be blogging and write 30 articles a month, right? Write your first article, write your second article. How do you feel after writing those things? How can you improve your messaging? And if you're still gung-ho about that a couple of months on, 
then put more energy into it. But in anything you do, always have a plan B. And so for me, if anyone wants to get into their business ventures or aspirations, keep what they're doing today. Just find the free time, the free capacity that you have to put your toes in the water and then test that out and then see if things stick and can actually grow before you want to do it 100%. Because more often than not, that alleviates the financial stress in your life. And you may actually pivot, learn a thing or two while you're in the process of getting to that new business venture for us, right? You may, for example, if you're a blogger and you hate writing, maybe you turn to videos. Or if you're doing YouTube videos and you learn that you don't like to be on front of the camera, but you have a lot of things to express, maybe you write as your forte. So I think a lot of people just through self-learning as you get older, you start to change personality or who you are. It's the same thing with business. You might go into business thinking one thing and after you learn a few things, Next month, you might understand that, oh, I don't like this, this, or that, but I love this. Let me try this instead, right? And so for me, one thing I got out of my corporate career is TNL, test and learn. Always test and learn, but if you fail, understand that failing is not a bad thing. Failing just means that that thing's not working and on to the next one. But the key point is if you do fail, fail fast and fail cheaply, right? Don't keep investing time, energy, and money into something that's not working out because you're just wasting money and time down the drain. But if you get some lessons learned from that, and are able to channel that to a new venture where it may be more monetizable, then switch gears quickly, take the lessons you learned from that failed business and put in that new venture, right? Because one of the entrepreneurs I have listened to, I forgot his name, but he went to my undergrad to speak and he said, everyone knows him for that successful business, but he's failed dozens of times behind the background and no one knows about that, right? They only know him for this company, being the founder of this company and making this much money. But behind that, he was testing to learn a bunch of times and failing miserably on all of them. But his thing that he learned is he's not wasting money continuously on each of these projects. Test them out. And at the end of that road where it's not really going anywhere, he's learned to cut the cord, cut his losses and go on to the next thing. And I think that's paramount. And even if you have an existing business, I think that's still an important lesson, right? Like you're in a business, you're trying to grow. Maybe you're testing out a new channel a new promotion. It's not working. Like, so let's say that you're spending so much money on Google ads, maybe change the message of the Google ads a little bit or target different keywords. But in the end of it, if your ad revenue is not as much as what you're, you're spending, then it's time to cut the cord for now and focus on a different way to monetize your content. Yeah. I love that. Just testing and learning. And then knowing that to get to where any of the Titans are. It takes a lot of increments. Like some people do go viral overnight, good for them. Most people don't. That is just not the most common story that I hear when talking to people who are far ahead of me yeah. in the game. Yeah. And yeah, and always think about someone that you admire, right? Because when I got into this thing, I remember taking the commuter rail to Boston for work and I read about a blogger making a thousand dollars per month, right? And I thought, oh my God, if I made a thousand dollars extra. That's like beer money that I can spend on like small things, right? Now it's not going to change me at all, but that $1,000 would help out. And that was like my role model at the time, because that was the first like foray into like, how does blogging work? What did she do? I read her blog all the time that first six months. And I remember after three, four months, one of my posts got caught on really quickly and I made above that money that she was making. And I never thought of myself as being someone who's better than someone. I've always looked at someone as like, oh, how are they being so successful and how I can mimic what they're doing, but translate to my niche, right? In my own like different content business. And one of the persons, Michelle from making sense out of sense.com, she was making, I think at that time, $10,000 a month, like $120,000 a year on her blogging business. And so that was my new role model. And I looked at her, I'm like, what is she doing? I remember she had a picture of a yacht that she built. She quit her job and she's on a boat blog all the time. I'm like, this is what I want. And then I passed her on year one. And I don't think I was really like excited, but I just thought like, I can't believe I got to where I am thinking that I want to make a thousand dollars per month. And now I'm at 10 K. Right. And then once I got above 10 K, I'm like, oh crap, I'm making more per month than I make it in my corporate career. It's nice to work both jobs at once. That was like the, the pivotal fork in the road where I understand that I can't spend nine hours of my life working my corporate career and then another eat dinner with my wife and then work another five, six hours blogging at nighttime for one or more. And I had to choose one of the two roads, right? But I had enough money to sustain myself at the time. So I quit my job, focus on my business full time. And it's been a couple of years since, but I think that even looking back, I'm a good investor. I try to save money. So my lifestyle hasn't changed too much. But when I take a step back and ask myself, do you ever think about being at this stage five years ago? I never thought about that, right? And so financially, I'm like super appreciative and happy that I am where I am, but I'm still the same kid who 
was trying to save 10% by using the coupon. Or if I'm shopping at jcrew.com, how am I using Rakuten, especially during Black Friday, to get 15% cash back on that, right? How can I pay that with a credit card to earn the additional cash back? How can I pay that with a coupon code, a promo code to, shift, to get more money? And what credit card should I use to even earn more points? And so I still do these things to save that incremental dollar too, because I enjoy it, not necessarily because that dollar will affect my lifestyle, but I think that mentality, if you keep the mentality no matter where you are in life, I think it will be very good for someone as they get older and wealthier because they're not blown money, right? You see all these cases where lottery winners win a ton of money, millions of dollars, and they go bankrupt after one year. I think that's because you don't have the financial discipline. But if you keep yourself in check and understand what's important for you and still do what you're doing today versus what you did 10, 20 years ago when maybe you didn't have as much money, that goes a long way in keeping yourself financially stable, keeping a good head on your shoulders, and moving forward into creating something you want without the financial stress that would come if you were living a paycheck to paycheck all the time. Yeah, that's good to know that as people get more successful, whether it is in e-com or blogging or digital media, since you found success in all of these different fields, that sometimes we do just hang on to like, oh, it was fun back in the day to look through rackets and deals and stacks and promos. And we still do it just out of fun every once in a while too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I still love Racket. And, and, and I think that you had promoted that before, right? Because during Thanksgiving, they were given $40 per sign up, which is a great deal, by the way, right? You, you yep. spend $40 at any of the partner online stores that you shop at, you get $40 back. It's basically free shopping. And it's not just Racket. It's a bunch of other online shopping cashback sites that offer this. And so actually, it's one of the things that cool my readers. Like, why, if you're shopping online anyways, why not sign up for Racket in or Be Frugal or Top Cash Back? Not only are you getting like a sign up bonus, but you're getting free money back to you. And regardless if you're making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year or making millions of dollars a year, who's going to say no to free money doing things that you're going to do anyways, right? And for me, it's a no-brainer. And so when some of my friends who look at me and they see me do these things, like, why do you care about two percent cash back at a website or ten percent cash back or how to max on these programs? It's because you have like that saving mentality or, or or how to optimize the mentality. You'll never lose it completely. You just more of how do you still maximize things and use as less time possible to maximize those deals, right? And so I don't care. If I'm making $2 million a month or $3 million a month, I'll still try to see that 3% at jcrew.com to get my next swimming shorts or something. It's one of those things that uh, when something gets ingrained in you, especially if you come, my parents are from Vietnam, right? It's a third world country where they came here with nothing. So I was born here. I, I understood what life was like as a lower income family. And even though my dad created a system business, I think that mentality of being scrappy and understanding the value of the dollar never loses the mentality because I know what it's like where you couldn't buy the clothes you wanted compared to other kids or you didn't have the latest Nike shoes. And now that I can still afford those things, it doesn't mean that my mentality has changed in trying to save money or trying to get the best deal possible, right? If I have the, the time, I'm happy. You know, of course, if you're busy with your job, then you can't try to like squeeze every single drop of water from, from a towel. But at least do like the top two or three things you can do to save money, right? It's, it takes two seconds to Google what the latest promo code is, or it takes you an extra second to go to racking.com before you go shopping. So those things are no brainers to me where other things that may take hour and hours for that incremental dollar, maybe that's not the best use of your case depending on where you are in life. But as a college kid, I did everything, right? And as a, a 41 year old now, there's a lot less of those things that took a long time, but I'm still doing all those other things that, that would save me money down the road. Yeah, I love all that. Such great tips and such an amazing journey as well. From everything that you've learned about points and miles, finance, growing your business, what would you say would be your number one best piece of advice for listeners today that we can fit on an Instagram quote card? I will say that you can't be the master of everything. So focus on things that you're maybe an eight out of 10 in and how do you become that 10 out of 10 versus things where maybe you're one or two out of 10. You're never going to become a subject matter expert. So maybe you can be competent, understand, and be aware of that, but don't try to be an expert at things that you're not and try to be the best you can at things you're really great at already, but you're not the best, right? And so I think at the end, it's really, how do you go from eight out of 10 to a 10 out of 10 skill set, something you're really good at? I'm a great personal finance person. I'm horrible at Facebook video editing. So we have a YouTube studio that I just launched. If I were to create content, I would not spend hours and hours on, on Photoshop or Adobe Premiere and try to kind of splice the videos to add music. I think it's best for someone else who's an expert at that, spend their time. I'm happy to pay the money for that. And then let me focus on things I do well, which is personal finance knowledge, how to get people to save more money, invest it better, find something that you're good at, and then try to be even better at that. And then let other things you're not great at and give that work to someone else as you're growing your business. 
Delegation is definitely key. I have yeah, yep. I've really leaned into that one. And speaking of delegation and referring to other people, can you give a shout out to somebody else on the internet that you would recommend listeners check out either for personal finance tips or points and miles tips or any other content you think our listeners would enjoy? Yeah, so I try to give, I think the David versus the Goliath in terms of sites, right? I love the points guy, but he's well known by now. And I think it's a little bit more commercialized at this point, but even though they're not as small of a blogger, I love reading upgradepoints.com. I love uh, reading one mile at a time. I think there's more tailored flight strategies and more personal experiences from the authors there versus TBG, which has a staff of 30 or 40 writing like very high level credit card deals. I think you'll learn a lot about those things. Like for example, it was one mile at a time where I learned about the upcoming changes to Alaska Airlines and how the redemption program is going to change drastically come 2024, right? And that kind of got me thinking, well, oh, how should I burn these miles before they become maybe less valuable to me and others? So shout out to those two people on the flying side. For personal finance, I would look at Dr. Credit. He's a pretty good site too. I've looked at him for years and years now, but he's great at showing you these daily deals that you may miss because you don't check all your emails or check the internet all the time, right? Awesome. And where can we find you on the internet? So you can find me at themoneyninja.com. That's where I post now, but we also have a YouTube channel that we just launched. The Money Ninja, the same name too. There's no videos yet, but my first one is I just bought a Porsche for $120,000, but because by maximizing all the business deductions and tax code, I bought that for less than 50% off. And so it's a blog post on my site now. I convert to a video. I'm just waiting for a editor that I, I found to edit the video. And that's going to be one of the first videos we launch on YouTube and go from there. Thank you again, John, so much for coming onto the show and sharing your journey with points, e-commerce, digital media, blogging, and all of the different forays into business. I'm so impressed by your journey. Love to come here, Julia. It was great to meet you at FinCon last year. And I love that you reached out on Instagram to ask me to help be part of this guest as a, in the podcast. So looking forward to this. And if anyone has questions, I'll check the video once it's uploaded and we'll answer any questions people may have. There. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards mentioned in today's episode piqued your interest, please check out the links in the show notes for more information on any of the cards. Also, if you apply for a card using the links on that page, I may receive a commission too. So please and thank you. P.S. I hear the links work better in Internet Explorer or Safari, and sometimes the credit card applications tend to glitch out in Chrome. Additionally, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast, leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. And if you would like to make even more travel hacking friends, please sign up for the Patreon to access our monthly Masterclass Hangouts. We dive deep into a particular points program each month, and you'll get to ask all of your travel hacking questions and enjoy being around other people who enjoy points and miles just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, head over to geobreezetravel.com slash hangouts to sign up to be on the invite list. Take care and happy travels.